Winthrop, get me Trinidad. Hello, Dad? I won't be home for dinner. We've talked the Three Stooges. We've talked Laurel and Hardy. Now it's time to start a new video series on another of the comedy greats, the Marx Brothers. The Marx Brothers did 13 films between 1929 and 1949. The first being The Coconuts, very early sound film. And the final, sort of final as we get to it in a minute, was Love Happy. And don't be fooled by that VHS box because Marilyn Monroe is barely in it. Some of the films in their filmography remain very, very popular today. Duck Soup, A Night at the Opera, A Day at the Races. Others tend to be overlooked or even completely disliked by a lot of the group's fans, such as Room Service. I thought for our next little series of videos, we'll go through and I'll give you my personal Marx Brothers ranking, talking about my favorites and least favorites and why. But before we begin that, I'd like to know, what are some of your favorites? So many classics to pick from, and a few underrated forgotten gems there too as well. So please put your favorites below, and as I work my way through my Marx Brothers ranking, please come back and comment and we'll see sort of what we agree on and what we disagree on. But before we get into the actual ranking of the Marx Brothers films, before I break down each of their main films, I thought I'd devote most of this video to talking about the odd man out. The Story of Mankind, which is often lumped in with Marx Brothers films, even though it isn't necessarily one, at least not in the most direct sense. The Story of Mankind was released in 1957, so almost a decade after the last official Marx Brothers film, Love Happy. And while all three of the Marx Brothers are in this, all their parts are relatively small, and they don't actually interact with one another. They're in three separate scenes. I've talked a little bit about the story of mankind before in my video on my least favorite Alfred Hitchcock films, because the story of mankind just makes me kind of sad. The previous year, 1956, we saw films like The Ten Commandments and Around the World in 80 Days. Both of these were big, multi-hour, full-color epics with a huge starring cast, and kind of this grand scale, all this spectacle, no doubt to help entice people away from their television sets at home and back into the movie theater. And I say that because the story of mankind wants very much to be one of those movies. But the, the budget wasn't there, the resources weren't there, and Irwin Allen, as producer and director, he would go on, of course, to helm many disaster movies in the ensuing decades tries really hard to make something out of this, but at the end of the day, it just wasn't there. You can see on the back of the DVD case, a huge cast with a lot of really good actors, and there are some surprising casting choices too. Ronald Coleman, in his final film, plays sort of a Christ-like figure, defending humankind from being eternally damned. Vincent Price as Satan is counter-arguing this in a celestial courtroom. The two bounce off each other pretty well, so that's kind of fun, and Sir Cedric Hardwick appears presumably as God, I guess, as like the high judge, determining if mankind will destroy itself or not. And then we have various actors appearing as historical figures, arguing either for or against. Some of these are quite good. I like Hedy Lamarr in her certainly final English-speaking film. I don't know if it was her final film overall, but she's um, cast as Joan of Arc, and while her scenes are obviously done on the fly and very cheaply. I think her performance is actually pretty good. One of the most famous casting choices here was the young Dennis Hopper as Napoleon, and he does a pretty good job with it too. And lots of Golden Age actors did small parts, such as Charles Coburn as Hippocrates. Peter Lorre is really good as Emperor Nero in a small part. But there are some moments that just don't really work. First of all, John Carradine as Pharaoh Khufu gets an enormous amount of screen time. He actually has both a historical scene and then a scene where he appears in the courtroom as a witness and he gets all these big monologues and stuff. If you look at John Carradine's filmography, the man was in practically everything and I'm sure he came dirt cheap, but he gets a lot of screen time here and as much as I love John Carradine, 
maybe a little bit too much going on there. And Bobby Watson, who made his career playing either gay characters or Hitler, his Hitler scenes are really pathetic. Uh, also made on the cheap, you can tell as he's standing in front of, it looks almost like a blank background in some places, quickly doing all these Hitler-esque speeches, and it's just, it's kind of sad, because with a budget they could have made something out of this, but at the end of the day, it just wasn't there. They didn't have the stuff that they needed. It's an interesting idea, but it really needed more in terms of resources. Um, we got to talk about the Marx Brothers parts, though, which are kind of interesting. Harpo appears as Sir Isaac Newton playing his harp and an apple falls in his head, and he has some little comedy bits, you know, he makes some faces and puts a stick on his shoulder and points at the apple tree like he's challenging it to a fight. It's not a great scene, and it's odd that they would pick Sir Isaac Newton, of all people, to play for laughs. I guess because they figured he didn't have to talk to do that scene. Groucho appears as Peter Minuet, the man who purchased parts of New York from the Native Americans for a mere, you know, bag of trinkets, that kind of thing. He gets a lot of witty lines, but it's also kind of like fourth wall breaking stuff and joking about how, you know, oh yeah, you know, the Native Americans will never be able to take revenge on the white people, that kind of thing. It's a really weird bit, and it's done very kind of tongue-in-cheek. And I don't know if it matches with the rest of the film. So we have two Marx Brothers scenes that are basically played for laughs. And then we have Chico Marx appearing very briefly as a monk talking to Christopher Columbus about the shape of the world. He has a handful of lines and nothing really to do. No, he does not play the piano, that kind of thing. It's a very strange film at the end of the day, and it definitely wants to feel like it's something, but... It really isn't. I think the Medved Brothers listed this as one of the 50 worst films ever made back in the 70s, and I can kind of see why. You know, it's a pretend epic, basically. Now that we got the unofficial, sort of Marx Brothers film out of the way, join me in the ensuing weeks as we break down the 13 official Marx Brothers films. Hope to see you there. Go out there and shoot an elephant in your pajamas. Of course, how we got in your pajamas, I don't know.